Baton Rouge, like we did. Jeff L.A. Fintech, going live with Ooh La La. The dog to the fireman, and then to the same guy. You know, the small town. For business, New York, trillion dollar marketplace and I like to start off with that because a lot of people don't realize how much money the unbanked opportunity really is and how financial technology and how blockchain can really solve these problems right but it all depends on how you solve the problems and it all depends on who you talk to whether they understand what the problem is or not and the reason why I say that is that we've been going all around the world we just went to uh, Japan and we won their audience award uh, competition for the best business model in their, in their financial technology banking uh, convention that they have there. It's like their money 2020. And that was literally last week. Uh, prior to that, we're the only digital asset company ever approved by the country of Bermuda. Uh, prior to that, we won several different awards. We were at NASDAQ for their blockchain uh, business development award competition, and we actually won the, the Drop Mic Award on business model. And we won that because uh, you know, the technology, their, their, their uh, PowerPoint technology was broken, so we had to ad lib just like what we're doing now with no PowerPoint. And we were one of the few companies that actually knew their shit. <laughs> right? I mean, if you actually understand that, 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 that's a huge difference, right? You got CEOs and founders that go up there and they need a damn bullet point to actually talk about their industry. And that's wrong, right? So how many of you guys are programmers? Just for sake of, yeah, programmers? All right. Uh, entrepreneurs? Entrepreneurs? All right. Blockchain uh, enthusiasts? All right. Crypto uh, gurus? Okay, you guys are everything. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how many of you guys don't do anything? You're just retired. You know, there's a couple of you guys didn't raise your hand, so I want to be you. <laughs> so a, a, a little a little background, so you'll understand where where we come from. Um, I was a strawberry picker at age four. I was unfortunately um, born on this side of the fence, and I say that unfortunately because my mom was pregnant when she came over. And she came over against her will. Now, the, the migrant story is not, is not just you know, t towards my family. It's towards everyone's family. Whether you're Irish or Asian, Latino or whatever, you got here somehow, some way. But the biggest thing that we all have in common is that we all try to improve our lives, especially for our children. I was the kid that was always with my mom when she cashed her check. And that sucked because I was her translator. So when you, if you can ever imagine being a, a worker, if you guys ever done this, um, she would get her check, go to a check cashing place because she didn't have a bank account and she didn't have an ID, and they would give her an ID at the check cashing place, but they'll take 10% of her check. At $500, that's $50. And that was in the 80s, right? When I was growing up, I was in the, okay, I'm gonna age myself. 70s-ish, <laughs> right? Let's call it 80s. Okay, so, you know, it's a lot of money. 
Right now, it's still a lot of money. 50 bucks is eggs and gas and milk and stuff like that. And you don't really you know, experience how much of an impact that makes in a family. And it makes a huge impact. And our family was over $2,000 a year that they took away from us. Unfortunately, there's a lot of bad sentiment when, you, when you're raised like that, right? We're raised poor. My mom used to get, if you guys know what pan dulce is, uh, Latinos are, grown, are, are raised on this sugar bread. I mean, well, how do you explain this, right? It's not a donut. It's like a colorful fucking donut, right? It's like, and there's like 10, 20 of them. And the damn thing is not a lot of money. It's only like 10 cents, 15 cents. But we can only get one. And we would split that into four pieces for my, for my you know, siblings and my mom because she was a single mom and, and granted, more power to her. Single mom, raised three kids and didn't ask for a dime from the government. And she literally said that. She said, I'll be damned. If, well, she said it in Spanish, right? Yo tengo pantalones, yo, yo los voy a creer yo mismo, no el gobierno, right? She has pants. How do you translate that, right? She has pants and she's not going to get any money from any government agency. And literally, that's what she did. When she became a citizen of the United States, things didn't improve because she was still with her old habits. And that's what happens. As human beings, we stick to these habits, and I'll prove it to you. Give me your cell phones for a week. What would you do? Right? You would literally die because most people GPS their way to here, right? Where in the past, we used to have Thomas guides, and we used to know every street. So technology is a force multiplier, but it also makes us dumb and stubborn. And it makes us, you know, our, our attention spans going smaller and smaller. So what ended up happening is that we use technology for the right reasons, right? We're saying, okay, because of this instrument, because of this, banking can now be done off of this mobile device. If we didn't have the penetration on the cell phone industry, we couldn't do what we're saying right now, right? The banking industry tried to do this, but they were too soon. Right? If the cell phone penetration wasn't there, just to give you an idea, 70% to 85% of Latinos, depending on what country you're talking about, have a cell phone. But only 50% of Latinos have a bank account here in the United States. Think about that, right? 50% of Latinos have a, 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 a bank account. The other 50% don't, doesn't. In Mexico, the numbers are completely opposite. 70% of the people don't have bank accounts. Costa Rica, Panama, Brazil, all these countries. And what we're looking at just here in the United States, guys, is that number I gave you, $2.3 trillion. Half of it is cash. That's what's powerful. So how do you turn cash into a digital asset, right? So here's the, here's the issue. They're, they're consumers, but not customers. In other words, I would go into your retail store and I'll give you cash. Do you know anything about me? No. But if I go in there with a MasterCard or a Visa, do you know something about me? Yes. If I go in there and I log in and I like your page on Facebook, do you know anything about me? Yes. That data, that data history allows you to say, my intentionality is I wanna buy bread or I wanna buy clothes or I wanna buy sneakers or I wanna buy this. If you don't have that data, there's no way for you to resell to that customer. Does that make sense? So you got a consumer, but not a customer. In the United States, the Anglo industry, we know everything about that. Walmart actually understands that if you play country music, people will spend more money. It's things like that. Yellow is a, is a high ticket color because you'll spend more money because of, uh, of yellow, right? And YouTube, I can actually tell your intentionality by the videos you watch on YouTube, and I can resell to you based on that data profile. With the Latin culture, there is no data profile. That's the opportunity. So when you're looking at these companies that are big data like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all that stuff, they're worth billions of dollars, more money than your brick and mortar companies because of data. So what do we look at? We look at opportunities in industries, right? And you say, okay, if you look at the music industry, you know, prior to Napster, it was all Tower Records and stuff like that. You guys remember this, right? You used to stand in line for a, for a CD or a cassette or some of you guys get vinyl, right? I'm not sure if you guys still have that. You still got vinyl? We don't want to talk right? about that. People. We don't want to talk about that. <laughs> My mom had those big eight tracks. Remember those things? And we had it in the car. I mean, that was like a hell of a sound system, right? Big old eight tracks. And then the CD came in, right? The little cassette, actually. I had the, the first Sony waterproof uh, Walkman, if you guys remember those things, because I was a swimmer in high school. So I used to have that Walkman. 
When the CD came out, we thought we were a hot shit. And then there was a smaller CD. I don't know if you guys remember that. It, it didn't go far. But there was a smaller CD. Then the MP3 player came in. And what happened? Napster. Napster killed the whole thing. So Napster proved that if you give people instant access to something they love, something they like, they're going to start sharing it with people. And the issue with Napster is they said, if you have an account and he has an account, you can do it for free. So the whole industry said, holy shit, that's not fair, right? So someone had to fix that. iTunes came in and came up with a better business model. And that's the same thing we're doing with Fentech. That's the same thing we're doing with banking. And banking, if you just to, just to you know, parlay this MP3 player you know, analogy, right now, 80 to 90% of all music is digital content. You consume everything on Spotify, on things digitally. You don't go to the store and buy vinyl records other, other than him, right? I mean, that's, that's it. <laughs> so you got the whole room and he goes to buy a vinyl. The rest of us get this on Spotify and stuff like that. Now, think about that. 80 to 90% digital consumption is now the big thing in music, right? And that took a while. That took a couple of years for people to adapt to that. Technology had to grow, and the adoption technology had to grow. In banking, remittance, when you send money, 97% is physical. 3% is digital. I consider that an opportunity, right? So it's the same scenario of what happened with Napster. Eventually it's gonna split, but what needed to happen with Napster is iTunes needed to come in. What needed for FinTech, what needed for remittance is this. And now that this mass adoption is able to happen on mobile phones, we were able to go into that. But we believe in, in, a, in a complete solution for the cancer. We don't believe in a symptom approach, right? So I can radiate this guy and say, he has cancer, let me put him in radiation, and his hair's gonna fall off, he might grow another limb, on and on and on. Or I can prevent the cancer. So in the banking industry, the biggest predatorial thing out there is loans, right? Payday loans that they come in, in some cases on payday loans, it's 40%. So look at the migrant worker. He gets paid, he gets a paycheck, and the problem is they take 10% off his paycheck, he goes to a Walmart and pays his bill. They charge him another dollar or two to pay every bill. So you got an average of four or five bills. That's another 10 bucks. Then he wants to send money to his loved ones because he wants to take care of his loved ones. And he sends money and they charge him up to 10% of the money he's sending. So if you ever send a wire across you know, the world, you know that's $45, right? Why? Why? Why is it $45? It's a ledger. It's a database from him to him saying, I have, four, you know, I have $500 to send. His ledger and his ledger have to agree on it. That is literally data. That shouldn't cost that much money. But it does right now because someone owns the freeway. Someone owns the channel. And it's the banks that own the channel. And if you're a banker, God bless you. You make $7 trillion a year in your industry. You greedy son of a gun. Why don't you make a trillion dollars and give six trillion back to the marketplace and let them, let them do something with it? And that's our approach, right? So we're saying, hey, if you own the rail, if you own the rail, you can charge whatever you want. An ACH, what is it? Three to five dollars on an ACH, right? Real-time ACHs. So what we did is we said, okay, what does the consumer need? One, they need to get cash into a digital format. That's the first step. Second, they need an identity and they need to start generating some kind of credit, right? So what we said is, if you pay your bill with us, well, what if you load cash with us, we'll give you a credit point, our own credit point on a blockchain. Second, if you pay your electrical bill, you pay your phone bill, you pay your water bill, we'll give you more credit points. So these are credit points in real time that you're generating. If you send money to a loved one, we'll give you a credit point because you're trying to take care of someone else. Does that make sense? So the, the whole, uh, approach to cancer for us is a platform approach. We're saying let them load cash, turn that cash into a digital platform. So here's the app, and I'll show you how this works. So the first thing that we did is we said, okay, how do you load cash into the system? We said, one, we're going to patent a system where you can find someone near you. This is my Wi Fi and my GPS that's not working. We're gonna find someone near you that can actually help you load cash. And let me do this off of a QR system that we have here. So, let me do this. I was saying you guys are like the Alipay of Latin America. No, even, even, even better than that. 
Okay, so we said, we said this. We said, uh, who has their app? Load it up. We said we're not only going to do our own QR code system, right? We're going to do a gateway QR code system to every QR code out there. So we patented a blockchain gateway QR code system that says, if you got Alipay or this pay or that pay or Ulala pay, I can literally just scan you. The system will recognize you, and no matter what type of QR code system he has or I have, we will do the transaction in the in the in the air, and he's he's able to get money through our gateway into his system. So that's one. Two, if I had cash, he would be able to get my cash, load money into me, and charge me a fee. So he is my walking, talking ATM. Now, why is it important for you to walk into a bank and look at a teller? Because of KYC issues, right? If you know the banking issue, you got know your customer and AML, anti-money laundering issues. So you need to make sure that the person you're dealing with if it's not a, a, a drug dealer, a terrorist, or someone on the watch list. Right? So this system can solve that. Yes. So we got real KYC capability by a third party in Canada that does always on KYC. So here's our argument. If you do KYC in the bank and you become a drug dealer a month from now, they won't know. Right? So I'm clean one month, but the next month I'm a drug dealer. They don't know. But if you do real-time KYC, always on KYC, I can know that the minute he does something wrong, we can kick him out of the system. That's all it is. For minorities, they want to be a good steward of their money. So for us, that was a clean system to do that with, right? So it's not just creating a QR code like an Alipay. It's to create an entire platform that can, that can actually service the Alipay people and service the people who don't have Alipay simultaneously, right? So again, it's curing the cancer, not the system. Now that was one approach. Second is our Uber mapping system where we can show you physical locations where you can go and take money or you can actually go and cash out on physical locations and we'll show you what his fee is compared to his fee. But he might be local, he might be a block away and he might be five bucks when he's maybe two bucks, but he's a mile away. I might just do this out of convenience. The point is to give the customer the choice, not you. I don't even care if they want to exit on a Western Union. I'll show you Western Union's price, and if Western Union is close to you, let you exit off of Western Union. Why not? Right? It's your choice. All I want to do is these orange bars actually gives you a credit history of everything you did financially so we can give you a micro loan. So we just applied, we just passed a DOJ, uh, Homeland Security, FBI background check to become a lender. And the biggest reason why we wanted to do that is so we don't do predatorial loans. See, in the United States, if you charge under 50% APR, you're not a predatorial lender. In my eyes, you still are. <laughs> I mean, come on, <laughs> right? But that's how the laws are. Someone paid off a politician and says, make it under 50%. So they charge 49.9% on money that I earn. Think about it. I'm selling tacos on the corner. And for every dollar, I gotta give you 50 cents. I'm a slave to the lender. What we're saying is social impact and making money doesn't have to be the right and the left. They can be together. And we're saying, you know, a responsible percentage is under 15%. Why don't you charge 10 or 8? Because that's what we're doing. And for minorities, the default rate on, on an in-store credit line like Curacao, and I'm just giving you examples here, right? There's Curacao that's here that a lot of minorities go to this retail store and they'll buy a cell phone, but they'll pay double the cell phone fee because that's the only person that will extend them credit lines, right? You can pay that cell phone off in payments. We found a way to give everybody a real-time in-store credit system. It's called a smart contract. So if he owns a business and he says, I'm willing to give a $50 in-store credit to anyone that qualifies. Our system will look at everybody who's loaded money and say, you actually can afford his $50 you know, in-store credit. And we'll show you his in-store credit. If you go to the store and activate it, we collect the money for the merchant. It's a smart contract on the blockchain. So we say the next time she loads money, we pay back this credit line. He gets his money. We charge a small percentage, 2% to collect his money but she earns a credit score. And now I know that she's credit worthy because she paid back that $50. She paid back that $100.
and we're generating a score that never existed for her because she's new to the marketplace. Does that make sense? It's an entire platform solution that we're after with ooh la la. That's the whole idea. But we're using everything. We're using AML, real-time AML, right? We're using, we're doing a, a, a real-time ACH. So that way you can have your ACH immediately. But we're actually contracting with central banks of countries so we can mitigate the, the fees that we're charging the user. So if, if Western Union is the cheapest fee for that country, we're gonna use Western Union. And not that you're Western Union, but you know, I'm using you as an example, right? He's white. So, Western Union. So, but if he wasn't, he's MoneyGram, right? And MoneyGram's a little cheaper, we're gonna show them. So what we are is we're an aggregator, right? We're aggregating everyone's service and saying, who's the lowest fees for that person? If he's in Costa Rica, it just looks Costa Rica, man, I'm just stereotyping people right now, right? And he's in Costa Rica, we actually have rails in Costa Rica that for up to $1,000, we'll charge $1. That's huge, right? And we do it because we can't on the blockchain. So we do an asset-backed credit line, not a remittance. So think about that. So if we have a bank in the United States and a bank in Costa Rica, right and he deposits money in the bank in the united states and he says i want my friend in costa rica to access this 500 bucks our system on the blockchain verifies that that asset is there and we'll give him access to the 500 dollars at a reduced rate because it's money sitting on our bank account that we get to reconcile whenever we want right so we don't have to reconcile immediately that spot so we don't have FX and all these other charges to charge. We can do it on our own. And the way we do it is we, we actually aggregate a bunch of people sending money and we do it one time. So we get charged an FX rate one time and we split the cost amongst a lot of people trying to move money into Costa Rica. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's cheaper ways to do it, but you need volume to do that. So how do you do that? So this is what we did. We growth hacked this thing. The only way you're gonna be able to bypass a lot of these fees is if you have millions of transactions happening at the same time. So what can we do to growth hack? Very simple, guys. The gig economy. The gig economy. Uber, Airbnb, right? Uh, Shutterstock. How many other gig economies out there? Think about it. All these people need to get paid. So when you, when you actually uh, book a hotel in uh, Costa Rica, Right? And you go to Priceline, you book the hotel. Do you think the hotel gets their money that same second? No. They get their money when I show up, maybe a month down the road. So they need a payment solution that will hold money for a month and then pay the hotel down the road. Does that make sense? So I'm one of a million customers for Priceline. Priceline has to do a million transactions. What kind of mass payout system is out there that can do that? Very few. Ooh la la happens to be a mass payout solution. So we've contracted with temporary staffing agencies that have a million workers, and most of them are underbanked or non-banked at all, that with one button, they can pay out a million workers. We've contracted, we're contracting with companies like Priceline that if they need to pay out a million hotels instantaneously, they can hit a button and pay out a million hotels for a million customers. If you're an Amazon seller, you need to get your money. If you're an Uber driver, you need to get your money. Our system allows those companies to push one button and do a one-to-many payout. And that's how you growth hack, right? So if we would do this business in FinTech and I would have to acquire a customer, my cost per acquisition is actually kind of high unless you do some kind of growth hacking. That's what we do. So for us, five years ago, we did an experiment. And I call it an experiment because I was a vice president of a merchant service company. And I own merchant service companies and collection agencies, so this is where we learn a lot of our trade. But what we did differently five years ago is we started servicing the minority business owner that didn't know about merchant services. We gave him a way where he can be his own merchant service provider. And we gave him a merchant cap online so he can start selling online instantaneously. That business model brought 60 million in revenue under nine months from a dead start, 80% minority. Because of that experience, we had a convention in front of 12,000 people, Mitt Romney, Vicente Fox, Visa MasterCard was there, I was on stage. We're educating these, these minority business owners how to participate in the regular market, and they were amazed that they can make money doing this. 
our lessons were their customers. 50% of all their transactions were cash. And we learned our lessons because of that business. Now, unfortunately, that business wasn't my business. It was someone else's. And he decided to go way left, and I didn't want to follow. But that business taught me that the minority market was worth a lot of money. I didn't know how much. We went to Stanford University two and a half years ago, and they did a study on Latino businesses, and it was 2.13 trillion two years ago. And just GDP in the United States, with 50 million people, right? That's a lot, right? There's not 50 million Latinos. I mean, fuck, my, my cousins are like 10 in one bedroom. There's no way there's 50 million Latinos here in the United States. That's just my <laughs> personal friend, right? And in Mexico, there's 140 million Latinos with 1.2 trillion GDP. Look at the numbers, guys. Three times the population, half of the GDP. 50 million Latinos here, double the GDP of Mexico. If this was just its own country, if Latinos in the United States were their own country, we'd be like the seventh or the eighth largest country in the world. That's a huge opportunity. And if you look at it, the Rothschild Foundation, actually we sat down with one of their advisors and they actually plotted that the next 30 years, it's all about Latinos. The biggest cohort, just in mere numbers, guys, in mere numbers, is Latinos. 60% of the economy is going to be Latino. And what we're saying is, no, you don't have to speak Spanish and eat tacos because Latinos want to be American. I'm an American Latino. I consume Garth Brooks. I shit you not, I listen to Garth Brooks. So, right? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I went to Vegas and got country fight, right? While all my friends are salsa dancers, I don't dance salsa, so, you know, there's only one lady here, so she's not depressed, right? She's like, oh, there's plenty of guys. So I don't dance. I'm an American Latino. I consume American products. I'm an in and out guy. I'm a sushi guy. I'm a ribeye guy. Tacos, I do eat quite a bit, but that's a stereotype, right? <laughs> but guess what? I speak Spanish. My cousin speaks Spanish. When you insult my cousin, you're insulting me. Right? So I became a millionaire. My, my, my godfather became a millionaire. I said, you're not selling tacos. He became a millionaire selling tacos. The guy makes $6,000 a weekend. Why would he do anything else? <laughs> right? So you do that for 10 years, you're a millionaire. So that, that's what happens, right? We do have cash. We just don't trust the system. We just don't trust the system. And all we're trying to say is, look, if the system takes, why is a bank account $29 a month? For the people who have less than $500 in deposit, it's $29 a month. If you have $5,000 in deposit, it's practically free. When I started having $100,000 in deposit in my bank account, I was giving the red carpet treatment at Bank of America. I was a Mr. Mr. Garcia. You're part of our Platinum Rewards Club. Oh, Mr. Garcia. Where were you when I was 19 and I was begging the ATM, please have 20 bucks in there, please have 20 bucks in there, right? And you're punching your code and you go, damn it, there's not 20 bucks in there, right? Where was that platinum treatment? But so what we're saying is the intentionality of the person should matter. I wasn't a bad guy, right? I became a good guy in the eyes of banks. But why don't you treat me like a good guy in the beginning and not charge me the $29? Let me build my history and that way I become a loyal consumer. And we're not going to talk crap about Wells Fargo. They have enough crap, right? Okay, well, yeah, we are going to talk crap about Wells Fargo. Okay, so when you charge overdraft fees of $35, you know, for, for the warning, you get $35 overdraft fee for a $10. So literally, this is what happened to me. I got overdraft 10 bucks in my youth. Uh, five years ago. Okay, in my youth. <laughs> I got to overdraft 10 bucks. They charged me $35. And because it took me three days to find out I was overdraft, they charged me another $35, right? So it's almost 70 bucks for a $10 overdraft. That is highway robbery. And if, 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 if they're going through bad times, they deserve it. They deserve it. Not only that, John Chang sued Wells Fargo for predatorial percentages just because your surname is Garcia. FICO was sued that if you're a Garcia, you have 20 points less than everybody else. If you're living in Southgate, Maywood, where I was born and raised, right? I was born here in Los Angeles, but raised in Maywood. But if you're, if you're in that area, you got a 20 per point less score than you're in Beverly Hills or Whittier or, 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 or who's, Downey, 
Downey's like the Beverly Hills of Latinos, if you guys don't know. <laughs> Everybody has mansions over there. That's it. Right? So I wasn't even allowed over there because I thought Nike shoes were more expensive. What, what I didn't realize is that the wealthy people don't like to spend that much money. We'll actually look for bargains, right? And I didn't realize that. So we always have these stereotypes in our heads, but we also have companies that have stereotypes in their heads. And some people say, well, Oscar, technology doesn't matter. We own the real estate. We have all these properties. We have all this uh, infrastructure. Wells Fargo's are everywhere. So what? So it was Blockbuster. And Netflix took them down. And one day, you're going to see ooh la la. And a Wells Fargo's going to go down. And that's our whole hope, right? If you work for the banking industry, I'll say this. If you don't wake up, now, you're gonna wake up just like Blockbuster. You're gonna say, what happened? Our report said this, I kid you not, Blockbuster's report said people like to walk into the building and serendipitously run into a friend. <laughs> it said that. And they said, we're not afraid of this digital stuff because people wanna walk in and look at the cover and read this, right? They said that, and serendipitously, I see a friend, hey, Thomas, what's up? <laughs> and somehow the report said we like standing in the line and buying popcorn on the line. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I, I, I like being half naked in bed and just ordering the Netflix, right? At two in the morning where I don't have to get up and go to a blockbuster. And I'll binge watch, you know, I don't know if you guys are into uh, Game of Thrones, but you know, I'll binge watch that thing all day long or Walking Dead. That's what we do now. We don't like commercials. What do we do in the middle of commercials? We're texting. We're on social media. In other words, our attention span is going somewhere else during the marketing dollars that are spent by these large corporations and saying, we're marketing to these people. You're not, you're not. Branding is all about value. Branding is all about reducing the cost of doing something we already do and increasing the speed. And that's what FinTech should be doing. If you're a technology person, look at this. Don't build technology and just slap on blockchain onto it and think that you're a genius. You're not. <clears throat> Look at the business model and see if your business model can be used without blockchain, without the new technology. And if it makes sense, if it makes the numbers, then build that technology and add blockchain. Because we added blockchain for one reason. We don't want a Deloitte or a third party or for our database to sit in one location where hackers go into it and try to get our data. We want, a, if you guys know how blockchain works, it works on Merkle trees. That means it's scattered kind of like uh, uh, the packets in an email. When you send an email, there's a bunch of packets that splits up that email. Half of it goes here, half of it goes there, it goes all around the web, it comes back on the computer and you can read it, right? So there's tokenization and keys that work there. The blockchain is just a step above that because as the Merkle tree breaks up the data and that's one block of data, the next block of data is doing the same thing and you'll have to hack both data blocks in order to actually change something. But when there's millions of data blocks, that's almost impossible. And that's the whole point. What we want is we want to show our data to a finance guy. And we want to show this, this banker and we say, Mr. Banker, look at the data that we have on this individual. He did do these transactions, not us saying it. The data doesn't lie. People may lie. The data doesn't lie. And because of that data, consider giving him a reduced rate because of its information. And what, what are we doing? We're mitigating risk on loans. That's all we're doing. The only way to mitigate risk on loans is data. It's proof. It's assets, right? So if I can show him that, then he can reduce his rate, and it's a win-win for the customer. And it's a win-win for our data. And it's a win-win for our technology. And it's a win-win for society. That's what we're after. So if you're doing something, if you're investing into something, and you're looking at the next bell curve, the next growth you know, industry, FinTech is where it's at. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But it's not everybody just doing remittance or everybody doing bill pay or everybody doing a prepaid card. If that was the case, everybody would be rich, right? The rush card. Good idea, bad execution, right? They overcharge their own community. Why would you do that? Net spend, have you guys heard of that prepaid card? Net spend, a million customers got, got deployed on net spend, decent rates, but only a prepaid card, no technology behind it. 
They sold the, the company for $1.3 billion to Tesis. You know what Tesis did when they bought it? They didn't let someone access their own money for more than 60 days. Bad business. They said, they marketed, put your money here in a prepaid card, get instant access. Ball, but you can't access it for 60 days. Holy mother of God, what happened? A mass decline on their valuation. They got bought for $1.3 billion. Within four months of them buying that and doing that, they were worth only $400 million. That's what happens when you have bad execution, bad owners, or greed that just pops into this. What we're after is lowering costs. Getting more people into the banking world. Getting more people to become actual customers, not consumers. And building up that data. And then when we do this, and we can change 10 million people's lives, we will actually, actually create $6 trillion of new financial opportunities for lenders that, that doesn't exist right now. And when you're bringing in a new marketplace, instead of gouging an old marketplace, you have good history behind you. Because of that, guys, we were invited to participate because of this business model, because of this approach, to go to the Vatican and present this idea in front of the social impact billionaires that, that service the Vatican. The Vatican helps out over 600 migrants in over 50 countries, and you know how they do that? A backpack full of money. And they literally go and they give someone money and scratch your name out and they go to the next person and do the same thing. And you got fraud and robbery and everything else that comes with it. Doctors Without Borders does the same thing, right? So all of these great institutions need a solution. Fentech is the solution, but mobile devices is the solution. When we went to the Vatican, we were able to sign a deal with the JRS, the Jesuit Refugee Service, that actually service all 50 countries with 600,000 people, and we got them to use our technology. They were able to bring us a partner that actually has 10 million smartphones that they're gonna give away to the unbanked and to the migrants around the world because of the Vatican Initiative, and all these people will have smartphones with the Ulala app already pre-installed on the smartphone. Not only did we do that, but we got together with Amazon because Amazon's providing Wi-Fi to the migrant camps. And there's another institution that's actually building the migrant camps, 3D printing the migrant camps, and then it's gonna be our system that rolls out the payment. You see, it's an infrastructure. It's a partnership. It's not one person that has a solution. It's your business idea and your business idea with his business idea, with my business idea that comes together that serves the world. That's what we're trying to do. And I hope I, I did a decent job explaining to you this, because I'll leave you with this. I was ashamed that I would go with my mom with footsteps. I was ashamed. I was ashamed to be poor. I was ashamed for my mom, I was ashamed for me. I didn't want my mom to, to drop me off in the front of school in this beat up car. I would rather walk to school. And, and that lack of dignity is everywhere, right? Our responsibility is to give this dignity back. And if it means just a MasterCard, I don't know if, if you remember when you got your first MasterCard, but you finally belonged. You finally belonged. I got my first MasterCard and I, and I put it down on a date and I, and I bought my date, you know, some churros. I mean, it's fucking churros. <laughs> but I felt good because it was on a MasterCard, right? And, and I can go, hey, I'm just like everyone else. And I felt proud. That's what we're really trying to do. There is a way where we can impact the world and bring dignity to people. Thank you very much. I'll answer your questions. Any questions in here? We gotta process it in. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, th this is a lot that we've done. Um, for those of you guys that are looking into blockchain technology, this was tough. We started a year and a half ago yeah. when the boom, where anybody and their mother can come up with a crypto coin and a blockchain company, and, and, and you got mama coin and, and Asian coin and black coin and, and, and stupid kitty coin, and people were just dumping money. 99% of those companies failed because they didn't really have a real business model. Damiano and I went to one of the first blockchain companies, actually he created one of the first blockchain meetups 
at USC with Andre. And they started keep on, oh, you're a USC, USC fan? I'm not a USC fan. <laughs> I hit my head on the, I used to be a diver with the US Olympic team at USC, I, I hit my head on that platform. I go to USC. Well, there you go. So, you see the platform, you see blood stain, that was me. So, but these guys started the first meet meetup. And you know what everybody was telling you? Everybody was a blockchain advisor. Hmm. Of course, remember 2007 when everybody was in mortgage and everybody was in real estate? I mean, everybody was selling real estate and mortgages. And then in 08, when everything crashed, nobody was in real estate or mortgage, right? That's the same thing that happened with crypto and blockchain. The only companies that survived were the real business model companies. We survived and we grew. We have a 7,000 square foot facility in Ontario. We're in an opportunity zone. And we have, because of this business development team, you see in front of you, with Alan, with Damiano, the heads of the team, with Andre, they used to be the, the, the Costa Rican Trade Commissioner of, of Costa Rica, of course, Costa Rican Trade Commissioner. But because of them, over 157 contracts with companies that want to use the app. That's real business growth. Every other blockchain company didn't do it. Right now, if you're gonna do that, they're saying security coin, utility coin, whatnot. Try passing the Bermuda standards for a digital asset. It took us six months, background checks like you wouldn't believe, DOJ checks, everything. But when you pass it and you have that seal of approval being the first ever, you're proud. But that doesn't mean your job is done, right? So what we're after with people who are getting into the blockchain world is create a good business model. Do good with people's investment. Do good with your ideas. Grow the business, really get use cases, and really get users. And if you grow that technology, then keep on getting more investment money coming in. We believe that blockchain is the future. We do. It can really eliminate all these middlemen. But you gotta deploy it the right way, and you gotta be a good steward to investors' money, and you gotta be a good steward to your own business model. We've seen too many people grab all this investment money and buy Lamborghinis. What does a Lamborghini have to do with your business model? Too many people think that that investment, that first round investment is the exit. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. See, you'll think like this when you're an investor. We're investors in our own company and in other companies. So we invest in people that actually has the, the as my mom says, the pantalones, the pants, to work hard every day to do what you need to do and not have these just Instagram moments, right? It's like, we got our watches, we got our cars, right? Good looking girl, woohoo! I'm living the life, I'm hustling. That's not hustling. Hustling is 17 meetings, doing meetings that you don't even know and seeing what you can get out of it and how there's a mutual benefit. The, the, the word hustling has been uh, raped in my opinion, <laughs> right? You cannot say you're hustling. That's not real business, but the youth, the ideas, the strength of blockchain is real. It's alive. So if you're getting into it, you guys are entrepreneurs, you guys are programmers, more power to you. But do good with what you're doing. So that way there's more great examples of how to do it right instead of bullshit examples how to do it wrong. But every cycle of business goes through that same thing happening in the dot-com industry. right? That, that is my, my rant. Don't fuck up. Do whatever it takes to make it happen. And if it doesn't, be honest about it and say, you know what, I was wrong, let's pivot. But you gotta at least give it everything you got on getting your business model to where you want it to go. Fair enough? If you're investors, watch who you're investing into, right? Make sure you're investing into good people that are willing to work hard every day. Not take vacations with your money, not do all this other shit with your money, right? Your money, we work hard for it, but make sure you're investing into them and make sure you support them, but don't get in their way either, right? You're invested into them because they're race horses. Let them run, but guide them. Show them what you know. And there's a, there's a great mix here of youth and, and, and you know older people like me that have gray hairs, right? We can learn from each other. The old ways of networking in the 70s and 80s, mixed in with technology today, is the shit. That's really what you want. But you gotta learn from everybody. That's really what, what we're here to say. Don't take your own ideas as the end all. Be willing to be open to everybody else's as well. Fair enough? Yep. All right. <laughs> Network, talk to us. We're gonna
We appreciate this whole facility, guys. If there's anything we can help you out with, we're willing to do it. Thank you. Continue networking, and if you have any questions, they'll be right here. Thank you. Thank you for my going on. Thanks a lot for joining. Share, retweet. LA Fintech.